Hello, I'm Todd Hagstedt, and I'm the director of the SIMS Initiatives. We are a digital humanities project of the University of South Carolina Libraries. Uh, we have generous funding provided by the Watson Brown Foundation. Our site and our project is dedicated to getting more people interested in reading the works of the 19th century Charleston writer, William Gilmore Sims. He was one of the most important writers of the antebellum era in America. Uh, with the goal of getting him more exposure to the general public and with Halloween right around the corner, we thought it would be fun to read one of Sims's ghost stories. We will be releasing a new section of the story every weekday in October, and we'll be leading up to Halloween that way. Members of the Sims Initiative staff and the larger USC community will all be taking part. Uh, the story we're going to read is called Grayling, or Murder Will Out. It's a part of the author's short story collection, The Wigwam and the Cabin. It is a detective story about a Revolutionary War soldier, a young man named James Grayling. And he is visited in the middle of the night in the woods, in the dark, dark woods, by the ghost of a recently departed friend with instructions on how to solve the friend's murder and apprehend his killer. We hope you enjoy it, and without further ado, here is part one of William Gilmore Sims' Grayling or Murder Will Out. The world has become monstrous matter-of-fact in latter days. We can no longer get a ghost story either for love or money. The materialists have it all their own way, and even the little urchin, Eight years old, instead of deferring with decent reverence to the opinions of his grandmama, now stands up stoutly for his own. He believes in every ology but pneumatology. Faust and the old woman of Berkeley move his derision only, and he would laugh incredulously if he dared at the Witch of Endor. The whole armory of modern reasoning is on his side, and however he may admit at seasons that belief can scarcely be counted a matter of will, he yet puts his veto on all sorts of credulity. That cold-blooded demon called science has taken the place of all the other demons. He has certainly cast out innumerable devils, however he may still spare the principle. Whether we are the better for his intervention is another question. There is reason to apprehend that in disturbing our human faith in shadows, we have lost some of those wholesome moral restraints which might have kept many of us virtuous where the laws could not. The effect, however, is much the more serious evil in all that concerns the romantic. Our storytellers are so resolute to deal in the real, the actual only, that they venture on no subjects the details of which are not equally vulgar and susceptible of proof. With this end in view, indeed, they too commonly choose their subjects among convicted felons in order that they may avail themselves of the evidence which led to their conviction. And to prove more conclusively their devoted adherence to nature and the truth, they depict the former not only in her condition of nakedness, but long before she has found out the spring of running water. It is to be feared that some of the coarseness of modern taste arises from the too great lack of that veneration which belong to and elevated to dignity even the errors of preceding ages. A love of the marvelous belongs, it appears to me, to all those who love and cultivate either of the fine arts. I very much doubt whether the poet, the painter, the sculptor or the romancer ever yet lived who had not some strong bias, a leaning at least to a belief in the wonders of the invisible world. Certainly the higher orders of poets and painters, those who create and invent, must have a strong taint of the superstitious in their composition. But this is digressive and leads us from our purpose. It is so long since we have been suffered to see or hear of a ghost that a visitation at this time may have the effect of novelty. And I propose to narrate a story which I heard more than once in my boyhood from the lips of an aged relative who succeeded at the time in making me believe every word of it, perhaps for the simple reason that she convinced me 
She believed every word of it herself. My grandmother was an old lady who had been a resident at the seat of most frequent war in Carolina during the Revolution. She had fortunately survived the numberless atrocities which she was yet compelled to witness, and a keen observer with a strong memory, she had in store a thousand legends of that stirring period which served to beguile me from sleep many and many a long winter night. The story which I proposed to tell was one of these. And when I say that she not only devoutly believed it herself, but that it was believed by sundry of her contemporaries who were themselves privy to such of the circumstances as could be known to third parties, the gravity with which I repeat the legend will not be considered very astonishing. This has been part one of William Gilmore Sims Grayling or Murder Will Out. I hope that you'll tune in next time for another section of this ghostly tale or if you'd like to read the story in its entirety or take a look at any of the other holdings of the Sims Initiative site, please come over and visit us at sims.library.sc.edu. We look forward to seeing you there and until then, Happy Halloween.